Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to this evening's panel, uh, Rivers of Iron, Railroads and Chinese Power in Southeast Asia. My name is Andrew Murtha and I'm Vice Dean for Faculty Affairs at Johns Hopkins SICE. I'm the George and Sadie Hyman Professor of China Studies and Director of the China Studies Program at SICE. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Sonia Holmes, Pedro Matias, and Madeline Ross for their patience and guidance in setting up this webinar. I would also like to thank the SICE China Studies Program and the SICE Foreign Policy Institute for co-sponsoring this event. It is my genuine pleasure to introduce this evening's panelists. David M. Lampton is Senior Research Scholar at the SICE Foreign Policy Institute and Professor Emeritus of SICE China Studies. For more than two decades prior to 2018, he was Hyman Professor and Director of China Studies at SICE. Professor Lampton is former chairman of the Asia Foundation and former president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. His previous publications include Same Bed, Different Dreams, Managing U.S.-China Relations, 1989 to 2000, The Three Faces of Chinese Power, Might, Money, and Minds, and Following the Leader, Ruling China from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping. Selina Ho is Assistant Professor and Chair of the Master in International Affairs Program at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. She's the author of Thirsty Cities, Social Contracts and Public Goods Provision in China and India. She earned both her MIPP and PhD degrees at SICE in 2005 and 2013 respectively. She joins us from Singapore. Chung Chui Quick is Associate Professor and Head of the Center for Asian Studies at the Institute of Malaysian and International Studies, National University of Malaysia. He is concurrently a non-resident fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins SICE. He earned his PhD at SICE in 2010. He is calling in from Malaysia. Good Wednesday morning, Chung Chui. Rivers of Iron represents many things. It is an ingenious study of rich comparative inquiry. It is a recognition of the new paradigm of Chinese power extending outward, breathing new life into the study of the interplay of domestic and international politics. And it is also a testament to the power and the possibilities when a mentor-mentee relationship evolves into one of deep collaboration, where former students become colleagues. Finally, it is also one hell of a story one with wide scholarly and policy implications about China, Asia, and the future of regional transactional behavior with all kinds of global implications. The webinar will unfold as follows. Each of the three authors, Professors Lampton, Ho, and Quick, will speak for 10 minutes. Then we will have a 15-minute moderated discussion. And then, around 8.55, we'll open up the floor for questions. I will ask you to please write your questions in the Zoom Q&A function, and I will try to get to as many of them as I can. Please identify who you are as well in your questions. Then around 9.20 or so, we will leave some time for some final comments before wrapping up at 9.30. And now it is my pleasure to pass the microphone over to Mike Lampton. Mike, the floor is yours. Well, Andy, thank you very much and to thank all of you for giving us the opportunity to talk about a subject of deep interest to us and we hope you'll be interested by both the uh, the monologues and hopefully a lot of dialogue as, as well. I do want to thank SICE China Studies and um, uh, Andy Murtha and Madeline Ross uh, for all the effort they put into organizing uh, this uh, panel. Uh, also, I need to acknowledge uh, this was such a large scale project involving by various counts nine plus countries that uh, it required lots of uh, financial support. And I do want to thank the Smith Richardson Foundation for the, uh, the, the major grant, but also SICE and indeed Stanford University uh, contributed money that made the uh, final product uh, possible. So I want to thank them. Also, the University of California put in a press, put in an enormous amount of effort, and I want to thank the acquisitions editor there, Reed Malcolm, 
for doing a wonderful job and including this in their um, Lilienthal series uh, uh, that the press puts out. So uh, we have many people to thank and uh, I just uh, want to express that appreciation. Uh, as uh, this book was in galley proofs, of course, uh, uh, COVID descended on the world and uh, of course tensions in US-China relations going up and there was lots of talk and is lots of talk of decoupling, uh, diversifying supply chains and so forth. Um, I think the, uh, the authors, the three of us, uh, uh, Selena Ho and Chung Shui Quick and myself, felt that uh, we wanted to dedicate the book to the uh, proposition that building connections is the future and building walls is the past. Now, of course, uh, we're entering a complicated era, but this book really looks at a connectivity project of enormous scale. Uh, and uh, I think on balance, uh, leave it aside what the pace of future construction will be and whether the final system looks like what we envision it today, uh, connectivity is going to be the long-term trend. So while we are mindful of the pressures towards supply chain diversification and uh, decoupling, uh, I, at least for one, don't think that's the mainstream in the future that we ought to be uh, overly uh, preoccupied with. Uh, in part, this book uh, is the story of how China uh, acquired the technology, uh, the engineering talent, uh, the planning vision to first of all, create a domestic industry that almost didn't exist that is a high-speed rail industry in the year 2000, and by 2013, 2014, 2015, had a world-class competitive industry. So one of the very interesting stories is how China put itself in a position to begin to talk about exporting uh, high-speed and conventional speed, or pretty high speed uh, trains outside of the country. That would not have been possible prior to uh, 2010 at the, at the earliest. So it's partly the story of how China developed that industry. And in, uh, industrial policy plays a big role in that. And so the book invites you to think about the role of industrial policy and recall America's past with respect to industrial policy, whether it was the Transcontinental Railroad or the Panama Canal or the Eisenhower Interstate System or the internet. The, the US government over the centuries has not been an inert force and has shaped infrastructure and many other endeavors in our country. And so in, likewise, in China, the government is playing a very, um, uh, let's say, assertive role particularly in infrastructure domestically and increasingly as an export uh, industry. The second major point I wanna make that I think is important, we're in this kind of a national mood to see uh, China as a juggernaut, unstoppable force, uh, fount of uh, ideas. Uh, and of course, there's an element of truth in all of that, but this idea of a connectivity, uh, and uh, Selena, can you put up the map there? Uh, is uh, an idea that did not have its genesis in China. It had it actually in Southeast Asia, uh, and it actually goes back to the British and French in particular, uh, who were trying to enter the heartland of China from their colonial perches in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, and South Asia. And uh, indeed, China was connected to Hanoi, at uh, least China's west to Hanoi, before it was connected to its own coast. So the Southeast Asians looked at the, the problem, the challenge of trying to connect to China uh, back in the 19th and early 20th century. And so part of the story is just simply uh, where did the vision for connectivity in Southeast Asia come from and how much of it was a Chinese vision and how much of it, um, uh, uh, let's say, a neighbor's uh, decision. 
And I think on balance, you have to say that the project and conception in its broadest contours was a Southeast Asian project when China got the technology, had built out its industry, had built out its domestic rail system, then China had something to offer that, that pre-existent Southeast Asian vision. So I would say in a very real way, China has jumped on a Southeast Asian idea more than Southeast Asia jumping on a Chinese uh, idea. Now, what, what is the idea? What is the vision we're talking about? This map uh, shows you in uh, sort of uh, overly stylized fashion, three routes. Uh, the hub in China, in South China is Kunming, and the terminus is Singapore at the end of the Malay Peninsula. And you will see from Kunming, there are essentially three basically uh, north-south lines radiating out of Kunming to the west, one, uh, if this vision is built. Uh, to the west, you have the idea of going from Kunming to Mandalay, down to Rangoon, Yangon, on to Bangkok. Uh, in the, what's called the central line, you run from Kunming down through the capital of Laos, Vientiane, and on to Bangkok. And then if the line is built, you have another one that would run from Kunming, Hanoi, down to Ho Chi Minh City, Phnom Penh, and Cambodia, and Bangkok. The first thing to note is all three of these lines meet in Bangkok. And so if this vision works out, Bangkok and Thailand see themselves as enormous winners. It's becoming sort of the equivalent to Chicago in the American uh, uh, continental development transportation hub for the middle part of the country. And then from Bangkok, all three lines run down to Singapore. Now this map looks small, but each of the lines I just described is bigger, is longer than the transcontinental railroad of the United States. So a number of questions arise from this vision. Now let me make it clear, uh, there, there's quite a bit of progress building the central line from Kunming down to Vientiane, and I, I, I would believe they'll probably be to the border between Laos and Thailand, that is Vientiane, Vientiane on the Mekong, probably around 2021, maybe 2022, something in that order. Also, there are discussions in Thailand, and uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi just uh, was in uh, Thailand, uh, and uh, I believe they're going to get that project going beyond a small test strip that they've already built. Uh, but in any case, what we're talking about here, if this vision were to uh, materialize, is something on the order of three transcontinental railroads. And this gives rise to a lot uh, a number of, I think, important and comparative questions. What is that? What is the vision and where did it come from? Why did China, why was China in a position to jump on this vision? What are the problems they're facing in implementation? Uh, how is this going to change power dynamics in South, Southeast Asia, uh, and certainly with other Pacific powers, including the United States, Japan, Korea, Australia, and so forth? Uh, how, how should the United States think about this development? Is it is it something that should affect our vision of how we provide development assistance? Should we get involved? Can we get involved? What concept should involve whatever in engagement we decide upon? Also, what, why do different Southeast Asian countries respond differently to the Chinese, let's say, initiative or to this vision, at least as it involves China? And the book spends a lot of time, and uh, Chung Shui will talk about it as well, uh, why di different Southeast Asian countries have diverse uh, responses. Uh, the next thing that I think we just really want to talk about is a few findings, and then I will uh, pass the baton to uh, uh, Selena. And one of the findings is that China does have a strategy. China does have a vision. 
And I think the sort of one sentence version of it is China as the economic, intellectual, human resource hub of East Asia uh, and its enormous periphery. And so uh, China is building Kunming. You'll see all those arrows radiating out. Those are going on the domestic high speed and conventional rail system of China. So that uh, this vision uh, is one, it what puts China at the economic center of development and activity in East and Central Asia, potentially. Now, while they have that general vision, and they also believe that if they contribute to the development of the economies around them, this will create demand for Chinese exports. China will be able to diversify its uh, supply chain southward. In short, China will uh, gain lots of economic and economic strategic geopolitical uh, advantages uh, from this. On the other hand, there isn't exactly a master plan. What projects get built in what order is very much a function of a very complicated system, a political system in China, which we talk about. But for simplicity's sake, we'll say there's a lots of initiative. Provinces, uh, state enterprises at the provincial national level, lobby groups in other countries, all pushing Beijing in the direction of their preferred policy. So while there's a vision that is China as the hub, it's a very entrepreneurial uh, um, uh, system in which what projects get built in what order and with what results is very much a function of what happens locally as well as what happens uh, nationally. Uh, secondly, uh, I think another major conclusion is that there are major implementation problems all the way from corruption to taking out unexploded ordinance that the Americans dropped during the uh, secret war in Laos. Just endless uh, uh, implementation complications. But what really calls, at least in my mind, for some explanation is, despite all the problems, why is there so much progress? Uh, and so what the, sometimes if you look at implementation, you get overwhelmed by the problems, just merely enumerating them. But on the other hand, when you look at what's happening on the ground, and we spent a lot of time on the ground from Bangkok all the way to the Chinese border, what strikes you is the progress as well as the uh, problems. So I think that calls for some explanation. Also, another major finding is I think China's uh, foreign policy in many respects creates some obstacles. It makes it, China's foreign policy now is not reassuring to many of the countries in Southeast Asia. So on, on one hand, they want to do business with China, get Chinese capital, build out their connectivity. But on the other hand, they're not exactly sure how connected in all respects they want to be to China and what some of the effects like ex added exports from China, migration, uh, tourism, the effects of tourism and the populations of these countries. So each of these countries has its own calculus, its own uh, anxieties. But I would say China's actions in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, in the Himalayas with India is not entirely reassuring to these countries and works against their foreign economic policy. Well, I think I've uh, said enough. I want to introduce Selena Ho, as she's already been introduced, and invite her to speak. Selena? Thank you, Mike, um, and hello, everyone. And um, I, I would like to start by saying thank you to um, Andy and uh, Madeline, and of course, Size China. Um, it's good to be back at Size. I've always considered Size to be uh, my second home. So it's good to be back, even if it's virtually. Um, so today, um, I'm very pleased that uh, we could share about our book. And uh, so what I'm going to do for the next uh, few minutes is to pick up from where Mike has, le has left off and um, to talk about negotiations and implementation uh, issues as China ventures into smaller states. Now, one of the things that uh, our book strives to be different from um, books on China is that we try to be as balanced as possible to give um, perspectives from both sides. 
uh, from the side of the Chinese as well as the side of the, the viewpoints of the smaller states. Now, IR theory normally don't talk about smaller states, as in smaller states have no agency. So the spotlight is really almost completely on the great powers. In this book, we try to do something different. We look at the interactions and how they react to each other, China and Southeast Asian countries. In fact, uh, three chapters of the book, chapters four, five, and six are devoted to uh, Southeast Asian views of um, this Pan-Asia railway. And one of the things that we, we, we have to buy in mind is that, uh, I think which Mike uh, mentioned along the way, is that um, while uh, China you know, offers aid and investment and technology, uh, the thing is that Southeast Asian countries have agency in the sense that they are the ones who actually went to China and say that, can you do this? We have this vision, we don't have the money, but now that you are richer, maybe you can help us do this. So I think that's something that we need to bear in mind. So by looking at the, at the behavior of our small states, we hope to, you know, uh, uh, that our book will contribute to a greater understanding of our small state behavior. Now, let me start by talking about the negotiation process between China and the smaller state. And I, I, would, like, I would like to highlight three conditions, uh, three uh, uh, conditions that determine the bargaining power of smaller states as they negotiate with China. The first condition is that size, wealth, and location actually matters. So Southeast Asian states are not you know, of equal size or of uh, same capacity, for instance. Uh, but you have middle powers and you have smaller states. So you have uh, middle powers like Indonesia and Thailand who actually have greater leverage when they bargain with, uh, with, with China than say uh, a country like Laos. So for instance, Indonesia was able to get the Chinese to agree to no sovereign guarantees for the project, meaning that uh, it is basically uh, saying that the Indonesian government is not responsible if uh, the project uh, fails. And uh, it, Indonesia also managed to get the Chinese to agree to a lower interest rate. Now, Malaysia and Singapore are also better, well, are better developed and they're middle income countries. So that helps in the negotiation process as well. Now, um, Geography. Geography gives Thailand a small, a major advantage, not a small one, but a major advantage. Let me show you the map again. Um, so if you look at the map, all the three lines, the envisioned um, three lines, they all have to run through Bangkok in order to get to Singapore at the end. So that gives um, Thailand quite a huge leverage in negotiations. Um, all routes must pass through Thailand. So this strengthens its, its bargaining power. In fact, in one of our interviews, uh, a key Thai government advisor actually described Thailand as a, in quotes, a beautiful woman who can wait to choose the best suitor. Suitors are referred to the great powers that come wooing at her doorsteps. Now for Laos, geography is not an asset. It can be bypassed to its east and to its west by Myanmar and uh, Vietnam respectively. In fact, in our interviews, there is actually a significant amount of anxiety in Laos among Lao officials that, they, that Laos will be bypassed. Now, the second condition uh, for, to, that can determine the bargaining power of the smaller states is state capacity. Um, secondary states have more options when they have greater capacity, such as robust government institutions, uh, ability to regulate and monitor uh, civil society, rule of law, and um, better uh, train human resources, for instance. Now, Singapore has state capacity and it's not overly dependent on uh, China economically. However, countries like Laos are heavily re reliant on the Chinese economy and technical expertise. For instance, um, even the feasibility study for the China-Lao uh, high-speed railway was conducted by China. And you can imagine that when the host, when the, um, invest, the, the, country, the country that's investing in, in Laos, China, is the one doing feasibility study, um, certain findings will be skewed. Um, the third condition that determines bargaining power is domestic public politics and public opinion. Now, this plays a huge role. Um, Ching Tree will uh, elaborate on it later on, but let me just say that with at least in the aspect of bargaining, uh, uh, this makes a key difference. 
Um, well, we, when we think of bargaining as a two-level game, uh, recalling uh, what Robert, Robert Putnam says about his two-level theory, well, the first level is international bargaining. So China and you know, the national governments of the South Asian countries. And then at the second level, we have bargaining among domestic agencies, right? Um, this bargaining also includes uh, public opinion. So leaders like former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Najib, and uh, Indonesian President Jokowi have been attacked for selling their countries to China, okay? Um, and there are local concerns over technological, whether, you know, things like technological transfer, job creation will actually uh, uh, manifest. And uh, there are also Chinese companies who often bring in materials from China and this sideline local SMEs. Uh, there is thus a very big question of whether economies of host countries benefit in the end. Now, negative op public opinion and unhappiness over Chinese presence actually exert significant pressures on these leaders, Southeast Asian leaders. So coming back to the two-level theory at level two, which is the no domestic level of negotiations, the win sets for Southeast Asian countries, uh, the politicians there are very small. So this ironically strengthens their bargaining position when they negotiate with China at level one, meaning they can tell China, look, I'm putting my domestic position at stake here. You have to give me more concessions. Let me now turn to the challenges of uh, implementation. So as Chinese companies venture into Southeast Asia, they encounter problems and issues which they are really not familiar with in their own country. So. Um, there is just a lot of trial and error and learning involved. There's a lot of delays in implementation, okay? And um, not that there are no problems with implementation delays within China itself, but the problems actually multiply when these companies encounter different political systems with a very confusing array of actors and veto points. Let me give you some examples. And I think I have um, about four points to make here in this under implementation. Uh, um, for, for instance, number one, they, uh, the Chinese companies encounter decentralization politics when they go into Indonesia, especially when they're trying to acquire land uh, in, in Indonesia. This is the first step for the construction of the railway to take place. So as a result of the delays in land acquisition, um, the Jakarta Bandung railway was actually delayed for several years. So let me explain. Um, Post 1998, uh, Indonesia uh, decentralization. There was there was decentralization and democratization of politics, and in that in that process, the center was actually uh, the, the central actually weakened. Jakarta actually weakened, while the re local regencies were strengthened. So the Jakarta Bandung Railway was an agreement between Beijing and Jakarta, with minimal consultations of the local uh, governments. So when, when the Chinese companies tried to acquire land from local regencies, they encountered huge resistance. So in total, there are 29 districts and 95 villages in West Java, which are directly Im impacted by the high-speed railway construction. So you can imagine the amount of difficulties that the Chinese construction companies face as they deal with very powerful local authorities and very strong land tenure laws in Indonesia. Now, uh, another factor that has hindered implementation is bureaucratic resistance. You see this very much in Thailand. For instance, the state railway of Thailand uh, makes money actually by selling land, but loses money when it comes to the rail operations. Um, hence, compensation for the loss of land is actually a key issue in negotiations with the Chinese. Um, there are also significant legal obstacles to the construction of the Bangkok Nongkai uh, High Speed Railway. Nongkai is at the border uh, with Laos. So laws and that offer, uh, some of these laws uh, include those that offer labor protection, procurement standards, uh, land usage and environmental protection. So what um, Prime Minister Prayut had to do was that he evoked an executive order, Article 44, to overcome some of these legal barriers. Now, the third um, point that I want to make about challenges to implementation is that having a champion is actually very important. Uh, this is the case when it comes to real development within China. It is also the case when it comes to real development in Southeast Asian countries. So, um, but what happens 
you know, when the champion actually disappears from the political scene. Um, it, we saw this case very clearly in Malaysia. Um, former Prime Minister Najib uh, was a stalwart champion of the East Coast Rail Link and the Kuala Lumpur Singapore High Speed Rail. However, when he lost power in the May 2018 general elections, these projects actually lost a very powerful uh, patron and was almost scuttled uh, subsequently by um, the next Prime Minister, Mahathir. Uh, but of course, Mahathir managed to negotiate and restart some of these projects. But there was at one point a real danger where the projects could have been cancelled. Um, the other obstacles uh, that, uh, that is related to challenges to, um, to the implementation process is that it's technical. Um, we can take Laos as an example. You can imagine that you know, uh, people who have visited Laos, Laos is really extremely mountainous. So it's a huge uh, task when you have to do things like tunnel through ter uh, mountains uh, and and, and build bridges across rivers. So it's a huge engineering project. In fact, a total of about 170 bridges and 72 tunnels are expected to be constructed. Um, there are also a lot of un unexploded uh, mines remaining from the Indochina wars. In fact, you know, one Chinese railway engineer working on the project actually said, and I quote, we should have the United States demine the area. So it's quite, it's quite uh, funny in a sense, but it's actually not if you think about the seriousness of the matter. Uh, in, in sum, uh, what I want to say uh, and uh, to conclude is that there are significant challenges that China experiences as it ventures into Southeast Asia, whether in terms of when they are negotiating terms of the contract or when it comes to uh, constructing the HSRs themselves. Uh, Ching Chui will elaborate more on this, on the diverse responses of the Southeast Asian states to China and also uh, uh, the geopolitical and geoeconomic competition with the other major powers. Uh, Ching Chui. Thanks very much, Selena. And good evening and good, or good morning uh, to everyone, uh, depending on uh, where you are. Um, I would uh, cover primarily about how and why smaller states in Southeast Asia have responded to uh, China-backed real project uh, differently. So this is a, a very core issue which uh, chapter four tries to uh, address. And in fact, uh, we call chapter four as the connecting uh, chapter. It's a connecting chapter uh, for the book in the sense that uh, uh, this chapter, by addressing the issue of how and why smaller countries are responses, try to connect the earlier chapters uh, uh, that uh, Mike has already uh, presented earlier on, the big picture and also uh, China related chapters, with the subsequent chapters, especially uh, the one that Selena has presented about the small state uh, agency. And also uh, before we turn to uh, the geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, dimensions of the whole uh, dynamics just before the concluding uh, chapter. And uh, so we use, we have uh, in chapter four, we have this uh, two by two matrix, as you could see uh, from the slide, um, so this is the metrics that uh, we try to identify how and also uh, to explain why. So let's uh, deal with the issue of how before we move on uh, to talk about why. So you could see uh, four quadrants here. These four quadrants represent basically four major types of uh, small state responses. And even though uh, here we focus on the I main examples of Laos, Malaysia, Thailand and Vietnam, but really the same uh, logic, the patterns, uh, the typology can be uh, applied to uh, other Southeast Asian countries. And I would argue also actually uh, the larger, the broader phenomenon of uh, how smaller countries respond to big power initiated, the big power centered infrastructure inducement. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, begin from uh, quadrant one and uh, quadrant two. So quadrant one and quadrant two uh, represent the receptive uh, uh, responses. They are very, uh, uh, enthusiastic about this project. And in fact, uh, in many cases, those are the kind of uh, embraces that uh, reflect that when it comes to uh, say Belt and Road or big power backed uh, infrastructure inducement, sometimes it's not about big powers push, but smaller countries are trying to uh, pull as well. So Laos particularly has been a very, very uh, enthusiastic and uh, Malaysia to a large extent, uh, especially under Najib, I would say that uh, even uh, later on, uh, leaders are basically very, very pragmatic. So in quadrant one and quadrant two, these two represent, I would say, enthusiastic embraces. The distinction 
between the two, between uh, Laos in quadrant one and Malaysia in quadrant two is that in Laos case, it, the enthusiasm embrace is more stable and whereby Malaysia's case, quadrant two, it's uh, receptive, but they has been uh, characterized by what I would call a cyclical recalibration. There are some adjustment. And in the case of Laos, the reason why I describe as a kind of a stable, in the sense that once the decision was made, and also uh, once the uh, groundbreaking uh, ceremony was held in uh, 2016, you know the process, uh, the construction process has been uh, going on quite steadily. Even as we talk, in the face of uh, COVID uh, issue, uh, we know that construction has been ongoing and the whole project is on track to be completed by uh, December next year. So that's going to be uh, the first uh, high-speed rail project in uh, Southeast Asia backed by uh, China that is to be completed. And in the case of Malaysia, the reason why we describe it as receptive but with recalibration and adjustment, it's uh, very much uh, illustrated by the case that uh, Selena has just uh, mentioned early on. And uh, you could see that uh, Mahadil uh, came back to power in May uh, 2018. One of the first things that he did was uh, really to uh, suspend three up of a few uh, China-related uh, projects. So East Coast Railing, ECRL Railing project, as the most expensive project in the country and probably in the region, has been uh, suspended. Uh, so there is a recalibration uh, there. But uh, as soon as the renegotiation uh, deal uh, was reached by April uh, 2019, uh, this has been uh, resumed and now under the new government, uh, uh, Perikatan uh, National uh, Plus government under Muhyiddin, they have been uh, thought uh, to kind of adjust uh, about the southern uh, realignment, but the whole project still continues. So this kind of a recalibration uh, uh, would uh, be expected uh, in the future years because of the nature of political system uh, in Malaysia, something that uh, I would elaborate uh, later on. So these two, quadrant one and two, is uh, kind of like a contrast to uh, three and four. There are three and four in the case of Thailand and Vietnam, they are more cautious, more selected. Uh, Thailand definitely more selected and also uh, more limited in terms of uh, engaging. So Thailand still engaged China, but in a very uh, selective and also a gradual, world, gradual way. And the perfect example uh, would be uh, the phase one of the sino thai project. Uh, by the time we completed our writing, only 3.5 kilometer, and I am saying 3.5, not 35 a kilometer, uh, construction has been uh, ongoing, and that's a part of phase one. And phase two from uh, Nong Kai to, uh, from Bangkok to Nong Kai is still uh, uncertain. So this is a perfect example to illustrate that Thailand engaged a China-related project, but in a very cautious way. Still, um, if compared to quadrant four, Vietnam, and that's uh, another, I would say, extreme, uh, uh, reaction in the sense that it's very limited, uh, if at all, involvement. Uh, the only China-related project, real project in Vietnam, is uh, really the one that the uh, urban uh, rail system in Hanoi, and we knew that uh, that has been uh, delayed for many times. So overall, Vietnam uh, has a very strong sense of power balancing. Vietnam uh, does not want to uh, put all eggs or, or have a too much a uh, dependent relationship with China. So hence uh, the limited uh, involvement. So these are the kind of uh, four major types of uh, patterns that uh, we could uh, uh, bring in to illustrate the how issue. So now, why the different uh, responses? I think domestic politics, uh, as highlighted early on by Selena and also uh, Mike, clearly uh, play a big role. Uh, and Selena early on, I think I uh, mentioned, uh, highlighted uh, quite a few uh, issues, like for example, state capacity, about size, about wealth, location, and public opinion. And clearly we know that uh, as students of politics, we know that uh, inter-elite dynamics and also a political system all uh, play a part. And for this project, uh, we've decided uh, to group this cluster of uh, domestic conditions into two big explanatory uh, variables. So number one, it's uh, elite legitimation. And number two, about power pluralization. So these two variables are reflected uh, uh, along the two uh, axes of this uh, metric, metrics. So let me uh, perhaps uh, very briefly uh, talk about the first uh, explanatory uh, variable, elite legitimation. So as a factor, it refers to uh, what ruling elites uh, do, uh, regardless of the political system. So all ruling elites want to maximize, enhance, 
and justify their authority uh, to rule at home. But the way how they uh, achieve this, the way how they legitimize their internal authority varies. And basically, there are three uh, pathways of legitimation. So from the slide, you could see uh, we highlighted about development-based legitimation. It's the economic development growth-based. We call it as the perf performance legitimation. So you need to perform economically uh, in order to uh, gain your legitimacy. And there are other types of uh, legitimation as well. So the second one, it's a uh, particularistic. So it's a particular idea or identity. This can be a uh, nationalism or perhaps a national-based uh, uh, sense of a sentiment, like for example, a Thai autonomy. So all this identity-based uh, uh, legitimation is uh, something we call as particularistic legitimation that uh, exists side by side with uh, the first uh, legitimation, which is performance. So there are, we have uh, two uh, P's here, and there is a third P. The third P is the procedural legitimation. Things that are about democracy, about rule of law, but by having highlighted these three uh, pathway of legitimation, performance, particularistic, and procedural, we are not suggesting that the uh, ruling elites choose one over the other. That's not the case. In reality, definitely in Southeast Asia, very messy, complex, uh, complicated political environment. And we have seen that the ruling elites try to pursue all three, but with different emphasis, different degree and different forms of uh, emphasis. So here, because of we are focusing on infrastructure development, so we thought that uh, it's made more sense to contrast primarily the relative degree of development-based legitimation with others, especially identity-based legitimation. So that uh, really explain, uh, for example, uh, uh, the case of uh, why Malaysia and Laos are more enthusiastic uh, than the other countries, because in these two cases, performance legitimation are the principal uh, pathway uh, for elites to justify their rule. And by contrast, Thailand and Vietnam, performance definitely economic uh, performance definitely very important but when it comes to their relationship with china there are other pathway of legitimation that is equally if not more important vietnam is a very clear-cut case anti-china sentiment anti-china nationalism certainly would limit and constrain a vietnam's china policy definitely uh, on the Belt and Road, but definitely also on South China Sea and many other uh, issues. So that makes sense, uh, that explains uh, why Vietnam's uh, case is a very uh, limited uh, involvement. And whereby in Thailand, it's not so much about anti-China, but uh, it does uh, has a lot to do uh, with the identity uh, element. In this case would be uh, the sentiment of uh, Thai autonomy. Uh, so during our field work, we have uh, heard many uh, Thai elites uh, saying, saying that this is Thailand. We want to do things uh, in Thai way. And that clearly uh, highlights a lot about the Thai uh, sense of uh, identity. And clearly, we need to also uh, um, bear in mind that this is also a military uh, regime. Uh, uh, and because of the perceived dependency of the Thai regime on China, I think the more reasons that uh, politically the Thai elites would want to keep some distance, not going uh, too far, so that uh, in order to uh, kind of present a political uh, shield against uh, other contending elites or even the bottom up from the society. This brings us to the second explanatory uh, variable, which is uh, on the left side of uh, this uh, matrix, power pluralization. And this is something that uh, uh, Mike uh, himself has been elaborating and also developing uh, in his earlier works, mainly on China, but here we are trying to apply it uh, to the case of Southeast Asia. So we have a high and low here. So power pluralization basically refers to the degree of uh, power concentration, centralization, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the competing elites and also uh, uh, other segments of the society. So why Malaysia's case, uh, it's uh, fluctuated, recalibrated because of decisions that made by our leaders will be challenged by uh, different elites and also uh, different parts of the society. Some, same thing, a similar logic for Thailand. Uh, so Thailand also um, uh, is uh, very much, even though under military regime, but you could see at uh, the bottom up, uh, dynamics is very strong. And as we talk, we know that uh, the political crisis in Thailand is uh, ongoing, which is another evidence of uh, the degree of power pluralization, even under military regime. So here, uh, this uh, uh, matrix um, clearly highlights that in order to explain uh, how and why smaller countries respond to China 
back the Belt and Road project, or in this case, the real projects, differently, we have to uh, bear in mind these two big uh, variables, uh, elite legitimation primarily, and then uh, the inter intervening variable in the form of uh, uh, the degree of uh, power pluralization. So with that, uh, let me make just uh, very quickly a few points about the uh, uh, geo-economic and also uh, geopolitical uh, issues. And this is a subject matter that we try to uh, deal with in chapter seven, uh, the chapter just before the concluding uh, chapter. So we want to uh, study this dimension primarily because we thought, even though this project is about China-backed real real road in uh, real road projects in Southeast Asia, but clearly other powers, other players uh, are in the picture as well. And we want to address the issue of the availability of alternative to uh, China-backed projects. So, and when we started back in uh, 2015, 2016, basically in Southeast Asia, there was uh, only one uh, alternative uh, scheme, which is a Japan-backed uh, scheme. 2015, we knew that the Abe government uh, launched the so-called uh, Partnership for Quality uh, Infrastructure. So for quite some time, a few years, Japan was uh, perceived as a uh, kind of the only alternative for Southeast Asian governments. And in fact, not all governments uh, kind of could consider that uh, the Japan uh, option, uh, either because of it's too expensive or to some extent uh, because of uh, Japan's own calculation. For example, Bangkok Chiang Mai uh, project has been uh, talked about for many, many years. But uh, quite recently, um, uh, Japan has decided that for economic uh, reason, they are not going ahead. But uh, what is interesting uh, to say uh, is that um, by the time we have completed our manuscript, and uh, in fact, I would say 2018 is the uh, turning point where we, where we see more powers and players are uh, also entering into uh, this chessboard of infrastructure development. Earlier on, US particularly uh, said that uh, infrastructure is not the game that we will play. And that was at the beginning of a Belt and Road and all that. But 2018, you do see uh, there is a shifting uh, uh, attitude and there is a, a build uh, act, for example, and later on followed by a number of uh, either US uh, initiated, but also involving other quad uh, members of uh, Japan, India, and also Australia in the form of a uh, blue dot uh, network. Uh, and uh, more recently, uh, we also uh, heard about the uh, so-called economic prosperity uh, network. So all these becoming like a, uh, uh, offering more possible uh, alternative to uh, smaller countries uh, in the region. And it's not just about Japan, US, and also uh, Europe. Uh, and it's not just uh, about uh, Japan, US, and also uh, other Quad members, but Europe also uh, is becoming, I would say, a key uh, player. Uh, also the same year, 2018, in fact, uh, before US uh, passed the act, US has uh, launched the uh, EU-Asia connectivity. So uh, that makes a very uh, clear direction. What is most in interesting, and that's my final point, is China itself, also by 2018, when uh, celebrating the fifth uh, anniversary of uh, Belt and Road, China itself uh, began to talk about a new formula for Belt and Road Initiative, which is what they call as a uh, third country or third party cooperation. So meaning that third country and third party, meaning that in addition to China and the host country, other country uh, should be uh, collaborated as well. And at the very beginning, in fact, I think the main targets of uh, the, the main uh, target partners of uh, China's uh, third country cooperation is actually Japan and also uh, India. And uh, we could see that uh, during uh, uh, Modi's and also uh, Abe's uh, visit to uh, China. So I think geopolitical and geoeconomic wise, we are going to see a more dynamic uh, uh, picture where the more power and player are entering into this infrastructure development chessboard, the more possible choices alternative that smaller states uh, could have and should have. And uh, with that, I will end my presentations. Thank you. To do before we get to the, the, the Q and A is I have a couple, um, I have basically one question for each of our participants and I just thought that maybe we can, uh, um, uh, Maybe we can, um, I can ask each of you, or I, I can ask them to all three of you and, and we can uh, kind of think about them, take which question first and, and, and uh, try to get through them. So Mike, the question I had for you was, um, 
you know, I mean, this is such a rich study that it's, it's, it's really hard for me to jump on a particular question, uh, especially when um, our, our, um, our audience keeps on coming up with the same questions that I had, so I had to come up with new ones. But Mike, the one I have for you is, um, you know, there was a lot of scoffing back in the, you know, back in, you know, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago about China's, you know, China's uh, intimations about establishing a, a high-speed rail network. Um, and yet what you demonstrate is in fact, um, China was remarkably successful in doing so, um, and making, creating the conditions necessary uh, for this outward expansion. And I guess I have a big question and a little question. The big question is, why were we wrong? You know, what did we miss? Um, and then the, the other, well, the, the smaller question is, you talk a lot about indigenizing uh, in China beyond simply kind of taking the technology. And, and it was, I was not clear about what that meant, what indigenizing actually meant. To say, uh, very, very intrigued. Um, Selena, the question I have for you is, what does what do your findings have to say about the conventional wisdom of debt trap diplomacy, uh, which we have heard so much about? Uh, I, I'd really like to hear your answers because it sounds like you might have, you know, quite a bit to say. Uh, and then, oops, which has a high degree of concentration and a high degree of legitimacy based on development. Sorry, I, Andy. I didn't hear uh, because of the connection. I didn't hear I'm the sorry. earlier part of your question. Sorry. Sure, sure. In quadrant one, you had, uh, you know, where you had high levels of concentration and, and uh, high levels of development based legitimacy. Um, I would have put Cambodia in that quadrant as well, except I don't see the kind of enthusiasm um, that was suggested in that quadrant. I see something that's far more ambivalent. And so I, I'm just curious about um, um, kind of how, how that enthusiasm uh, manifests itself and, and, it, and its enthusiasm on, on the part of which, kind of which segment of, the, uh, of the, the state versus the society, even in a, in a, even in a particularly concentrated uh, top-down system. So those th those are the questions that I wanted to throw out uh, to you. There's a, there's a, there's a bunch more on deck, but um, Mike, did you? Um... Yeah, I uh, I was intrigued by your question. Uh, I, I think um, succinctly put was why were we wrong about the degree of progress and ultimate effect of China's domestic infrastructure build out. And I would say we could also, why are we predisposed to underestimate what may result from this uh, initiative by both China and the Southeast Asian countries? I think in short, we're prone to underestimate what China has or is likely to, right. to produce. That, that deserves a lot of discussion, but I think that's the core question. And I think uh, or you could just put it positively, why did China, was, why was China able to move so rapidly? <laughs> so my answer will sort of be on both of those. Why did we underestimate and why could they go so rapidly? One of the, to me, interesting uh, parts or, uh, of the book uh, deals with the biography of the Minister of Railroads. Uh, his name was Leo Jurjun. In fact, as far as I know, he's still living, although in prison or at least under some kind of detention in China. But he was a truly remarkable entrepreneur within the Chinese bureaucratic system. So I would think oftentimes when you find big dramatic changes, and I'm not one that describes all change to all seen wise leaders, but in any case, entrepreneurship and vision are important. And I think first thing I would say is on this issue, the central government got the right guy in charge of the program. Uh, and so that's the first thing. Secondly, China really was more pragmatic than you might think. Uh, Leo Jurjun's key theory was is the best technology lies in Europe. 
uh, we should unabashedly buy that technology and cut a deal will give the Europeans some at least short-term business in exchange for the rights to this technology, the rights to adapt it and build our own brand name. And let's put it this way, the Europeans, uh, in particular the French and uh, the Canadians to a certain extent and the Japanese, all were willing to make that deal. So China actually in the setting here made a commercially attractive deal. Now. Uh, I think there's a lot of regret now of having transferred so much uh, technology to China that it, now they're facing a competitive industry. But the point is you had a good Chinese leader uh, for these purposes, and you also had an attractive financial arrangement. Uh, thirdly, uh, and this is something that the Chinese, I believe, share with almost all the Southeast Asian leaders with whom we spoke. And that is the, the Chinese aphorism, if you want to get rich, build a road. The idea is build infrastructure and growth will come. It's sort of the field of dreams approach. You know, build it and the people will fill the stands, right? Well, frankly, we're in such a frame of mind of seeing China as imposing everything on its surrounding environment that it, it doesn't always occur to us that maybe the Chinese are actually proposing something people are attracted to. And so I think there's a basic um, shared view to various extents, depending on the country. But the notion is you can't wait for people to get rich and then build infrastructure. You got to build the infrastructure and then development will occur along these nodes. And uh, the U.S. got out of the infrastructure business, both domestically to some extent, and now you can see the results of that here, but also in terms of multilateral organizations, World Bank, AID, uh, all of these development agencies, either country or multilateral, uh, to greater or lesser degrees got out of the infrastructure business. Well, China was the only one in it. And so a lot of countries, if they wanted to move in this direction, China was supplying what people a, needed, and secondly, had a view that infrastructure leads development. Uh, of course, all of this couldn't have happened if you hadn't had China growing 10 per, oh, 9 percent compounded for 30 years. I mean, China had a lot of money, particularly when the economy, when you still had financial repression and the state could tap these resources. So. I think, uh, and I think those factors account for both uh, the push externally. Uh, just say one last thing, China's external push came after it had substantially built out its domestic system. And just like the French in the 19th century, who had, which had too much steel, wanted to export it to Southeast Asia to build railroads, China's now got too much steel and concrete and, and, uh, and has employment needs for engineers and so forth. So China's got excess capacity. And that's one reason that it's so uh, interested in exporting this. But I, I, it's, it's a complicated story. But I think we, we are a little too much in the um, framework of all the reason China's going to fail. Uh, rather than, well, 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 let's look at some of the assets here and why they might accomplish more than you expect. Okay. Uh, Andy, shall I answer the next, uh, the question you have for me? Okay. So uh, your question, sure. what do I make of the debt trap uh, diplomacy, right? Um, I think that phrase, uh, debt trap diplomacy, suggests um, that it is deliberate uh, on the part of the Chinese uh, but I also think that that term is the result of punditry and is also being politicized by certain uh, quarters and people with certain agendas, uh, whether it's with respect to China uh, or, or, or something else or selling, just selling newspapers. Um, what, but I think that that term is oversimplified. Uh, the whole uh, issue of that is actually uh, uh, very much more nuanced, okay? Um, I, I can understand why people would say, you know, you know, that it looks like a debt trap. I mean, if you think that Laos, um, you know, there are real national security and uh, uh, national sovereignty issues that could be uh, affected by this uh, being in debt to China. Well, Laos, for instance, is about um, 
the debt that Laos owed to China is about 45% of Laos GDP. That's a huge amount, right? Um, but, um, and you know, what, what are the means? How is, China go, uh, is Laos going to pay this, right? But I think we have to be very clear that a lot of these projects, uh, you know, it's Southeast Asian countries or, you know, uh, even a country like Sri Lanka going to China asking for help. So um, we have to be mindful that Laos uh, is willing to take on these risks, knowing full well that uh, the, the risks that are involved, the, the, uh, the amount of debt is going to owe China, which might have to be repaid in terms of land concessions or, you know, uh, in terms of the minerals, uh, potassium and bauxite that they have to send to China. Um, so for, for, for La in the, the way that the, the people like Laos are thinking is, if we don't take this risk, then we will not, we will not grow, we will be poor. So this is literally a, almost a quote, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but it was a quote from one of our interviews. And this kind of sentiment is actually very prevalent in uh, Laos and uh, different parts of Southeast Asia as well. Um, and the other thing that we want, to, we want to bear in mind is that when China gives out these loans, it is carrying on risk for itself too, uh, risk to its own banking system. So I think that, you know, you, you, you have heard reports of Chinese bankers coming out to warn of these kind of loans that are being, um, uh, being uh, given to countries, uh, developing countries, right? And, and one of the things we have to bear in mind that actually in 2014, and I think it's uh, in the book, it's written in the book, in 2014, actually, China suspended loans to Laos, precisely because they fear uh, the impact of this kind of loans, uh, knowing that, lo uh, that Laos will not be able to return these loans, uh, will have on you know, their own banking system. So I, I think it's much more nuanced than that, Andy. That's my, uh, that's my short answer. Uh, Andy, can I respond to your excellent question? And perhaps Selena will need your help to uh, put up the slide for the two by two metrics. Uh, Andy, can you hear me? Is uh, Andy from? Yeah. Um, but, right, okay, I think he should be back at. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me uh, address that. Um, why the, I think Andy asked a very good uh, question as to uh, why Cambodia uh, is not uh, listed in the quadrant uh, one. So I agree with uh, Andy's assumption, also observation that uh, theoretically, logically, uh, Cambodia should be uh, there. And that's uh, clearly the case. But because our book project actually concentrate on the real uh, road project rather than uh, uh, Belt and Road related project in general, and hence uh, we didn't, uh, we choose to focus on Laos, which actually uh, has a real road project ongoing and the most uh, receptive one, and we uh, have it here. But in my other project uh, that I try to cover um, the broader types of uh, infrastructure project, the one that I collaborate with uh, British scholar Dr. Lee Jones, uh, we try to compare all 10 ASEAN countries' uh, responses to Belt and Road related projects. And in that particular project clearly uh, shows that uh, Cambodia, just like Laos, is very enthusiastic about China uh, back uh, infrastructure project. And in the real cases, you do see that uh, Cambodia has a lot of uh, projects with China, and but that concentrate on other types of uh, project. So the issue here is not so much about Cambodia not in quadrant one. The issue here is why Cambodia's uh, infrastructure, very close uh, infrastructure projects with China concentrate on other types of infrastructure rather than real. And hence, I think uh, the variables about the development uh, needs and also uh, urgency are uh, coming to play. I, I think Mike will recall, uh, during one of our few work in uh, oh. Cambodia, we actually uh, uh, took, rented a car travel from uh, the capital, uh, Phnom Penh to Sihanouk's view. It is quite a, not a very long distance, it's only like 180 uh, kilometer, but it took us five or six hours. Yeah. And uh, because of the road condition is so bad. That, so that shows that because of the level of development of individual countries, in this case, uh, Cambodia, different the governments uh, of respective countries will have to judge. Other than political logic, they also uh, need to think along the development uh, logic. So some infrastructure projects 
are more urgently needed than the others. So, so Cambodia, expressway, ports and other things uh, would be more urgent, more needed than uh, say, for example, a high-speed rail. In the case of uh, Laos, it's uh, very different. I think Selena early on uh, make it very clearly. It's, uh, for them, it's kind of a do or die because of uh, mm. Laos is a landlocked country. So they see a land link, uh, they see a high-speed rail uh, as kind of a, a, a solution, both for their development and also a political uh, law logic that they need, to, they need to have it in order to uh, overcome and also address these uh, gaps in uh, many ways. So I hope uh, I answer uh, your excellent question, uh, Andy. Well, I'm, uh, thank Andy, you. Could I say a word on that? Please, Mike. Yeah, I just can't, would, Cambodia is a really interesting case and it makes the general point that each of these countries is tremendously complex and the kinds of things that influence uh, uh, decisions in their complexity are not captured by one or two variables. But Cambodia, and you know much more about it than I do, but I was struck by the degree to which the Cambodians, though they're seen as so closely aligned with China, the degree of penetration by Chinese commercial interests, gambling interests, uh, tourists, uh, have, uh, let's put it this way, created a certain amount of cultural friction with, with the Cambodians. So that, that struck me. Also, China, while it might, uh, on the one hand, be um, you know, seen in, in threatening terms, is also seen as a big power that will protect Cambodia from uh, Thailand and Vietnam. So th these countries sometimes see security problems where, where we're not attuned to that, and therefore see China as, a, as, a, as comprehensively more useful then maybe we quite understand. That, it's it's really true. I mean, there's a there's a. I'll come back to 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 that point uh, in my in my just my concluding um, uh, words. But what I want, thank you, Mike, and and and, and thank you, um, uh, Selena and Chung Tui. We're running a little bit behind schedule uh, in part because of the um, connectivity problems that I've been having. So what I'd like to do is just move to the Q and A. Um, what I wanted to uh, ask is, uh, I wanted to start, if, if I could, with um, uh, our, our, our friend and colleague, Peter Boutelier. Uh, his question is, he has said he says two related questions. Um, the first is, what do we know about the proposed financing of these large projects? But the second one is, is it possible that some of these projects will be affected by a shortage of Chinese financial resources due to the Chinese and global economic slowdown uh, and apparent shift in CCP priorities? Um, uh, he's, he doesn't say this in the question, but I'm, I'm uh, inferring uh, in, in, in part due to um, the fallout from COVID. Uh, so I'll just throw the, the question open uh, to, uh, to all of you. Uh, and uh, whoever would like to. Um... Um, well, I'd be glad to just throw out a couple of ideas for my colleagues to um, uh, elaborate on or correct or indeed declare to be inaccurate. Um, on, let's talk about the slowdown first. Uh, well, first of all, China is, is slowing down, has been before COVID. Uh, certainly COVID has reduced it further, but my understanding is, is growth is positive in China. There are various estimates about how positive, but probably at least a couple of percent, even if you're kind of conservative. And China, uh, I, I think, is on an upward trajectory uh, if you take the, the nadir of COVID. Uh, for the Chinese economy as your base. So they, they are slowing down, have been slowing down, but they don't have zero growth. And of course, I think they still amount to what? About one third of total global growth, right? So uh, yes, they'll probably slow down, They're probably for another reason too. And that is China is now, because of its experiences in Pakistan and with, with Chavez in, in Venezuela, some problematic projects in Africa and so forth, China's beginning to pay more attention to political risk and partly for lessons it learned in Southeast Asia. Uh, 
as one of them put it to us, you know, democratic countries are a little more risky to deal with <laughs> because they change people and networks and, and who you're negotiating with. So uh, I, I think China is paying more attention to financial and political risk. And that combined with a slowing economy, combined with COVID, combined with, uh, frankly, there are a lot of people in China that are upset that China's devoting so much uh, foreign aid as they would see it uh, abroad. And in fact, uh, a professor at Tsinghua University, Xu Zhangrun, uh, has uh, wrote a, uh, an extensive critique of all these uh, projects, particularly in Southeast Asia, but around the world, and condemn the party uh, for these uh, profligate uh, uh, things. And certainly COVID points to the need for healthcare and all, all of that, China's aging population. So there's, there's a big pushback in China itself. So my guess is yes, it will slow down, but there's a countervailing attitudes among strategic people in China, and that is the U.S. is stumbling. The U.S. doesn't have its act together. China's performing fairly well, at least in some measures. I'm not endorsing all their policies like Xinjiang and so forth. But the point is, I think there's a feeling in China, now is our opportunity, let's push. So yes, I expect some slowdown, but not as dramatic as some people might either anticipate or hope. Thanks, Mark. Selena? Yeah, maybe I'll just add that, you know, um, not so much about the financial part, but uh, in terms of whether COVID is actually slowing down some of these projects. Um, it, one of the cases, uh, it might be in certain cases where COVID hit really hard, but for example, in, in Laos, the project was actually suspended for like 23 days. But it uh, you know, after 23 days, it came back online and it's due, it's going to be in time for the scheduled uh, finishing of the project, which is December 2021. And that's just next year, in one year's time. So it's, it's, uh, it's oh, things are moving ahead, you know, so it's not, um, there will be some, you know, some stumbling along the way, but I don't think that at the end of the day, um, that it will be significantly um, changing the trajectory of the, of the railway projects. Thanks. Professor Peter Montalia was my teacher when I was a student at SAIS. So very uh, happy to see uh, he posed two questions here. Let me deal with uh, his second question uh, before dealing with the first. So the second question is about uh, whether or not, uh, you know, to what extent the shortage of uh, Chinese-owned uh, financial resources might have an impact on these dynamics. Early on, I mentioned about the, the new formula, so to speak, uh, China's uh, third country cooperation. And to me, that initiative or that, that arrangement, that proposal, that idea, perhaps uh, indicates uh, to a large extent uh, China realized about the financial sustainability uh, issue on its part, but also uh, about the political uh, sustainability of a uh, China-backed project. So that initiative perhaps uh, is an indicator of uh, China's own financial uh, um, you know, sustainability of supporting all these uh, projects uh, regionally and globally. It's going to be a yeah, if not, has already become a factor in uh, this whole process. And then the earlier question about the financing uh, mode and all that, clearly I think this is a, a big, big factor if we uh, concentrate primarily on the host country's perspective. For example, in the case of Malaysia, uh, some people uh, call uh, Malaysia as a kind of ground zero of uh, Belt and Road in Southeast Asia. So in Malaysia, you see uh, different types of uh, China-related real projects, and they all vary uh, in many ways, but definitely a financial mode, I would say, it, it, it differs. For example, ECRL, it's a true loan, and uh, it is linked to uh, the scandal of uh, 1MDB, so it makes the whole process uh, become politically highly contestable. Uh, but renegotiation uh, helped to address that, but it does uh, involve a kind of loan and also a debt issue. But on other projects that uh, China has in Malaysia, for example, uh, the Gemas uh, JB uh, double tracking, that is uh, actually less a problem because of it is uh, not so much about loan. And then China also uh, have other like uh, uh, different type of infrastructure projects. For example, in a, pay, a place uh, called uh, Para in Batu Gajah, uh, CRRC established a very, uh, I would say, good project in the sense that, uh, you know, they are establishing a, a factory to, to uh, produce, manufacture a locomotive, the uh, rolling stock. 
and uh, with the aim of using Malaysia as the uh, hub to uh, uh, produce and export for the demands and needs uh, in Malaysia and also ASEAN region. Mm -hmm. So those are investment, they are not a, a, a loan and hence, uh, you know, the so-called uh, debt trap issue and all that, I don't think is uh, relevant here. Thank you all. I'm going to move to uh, the next question, which comes from Perry Bloom. Um, uh, and he asks about the impact of China's dam building on the upper Mekong uh, and, and, and the effect that that has or the, uh, on the, um, the high-speed rail development and vice versa. So the, do the two kind of exist as, as kind of to mix a metaphor, ships passing in the night, or do they actually have some sort of a kind of an interactive effect that might complicate things? Maybe I'll take a step at that. Should but, I? Um, okay, because I, I do look at dam building activities. Um, um, I actually want to say, I mean, I, I'm going to try and unpack this question because it's a very broad question and um, I'm trying to get to the root of it. But um, one of the things that we have to bear in mind when we look at this um, um, is that all the dams, uh, all the countries in Southeast Asia are involved in dam buildings. So you'll find that in Laos, there's a very controversial dam, uh, the Sayaburi Dam, right? And um, so Laos is, is, is the second highest riparian on the, on the Mekong. So I would say the national governments, uh, with perhaps the exception of Thailand, which has uh, voiced some criticisms of uh, some of these activities, um, well, under Prayut, that might have changed, but previously there, there was. But um, most of the national governments actually do not criticize the, the dam building projects on the upper Mekong. The criticisms that we hear, and this is where we need to bear in mind the differences between the elites and the uh, lower level of society, uh, the non-state actors. The criticisms that we hear are actually from civil society groups, uh, which Thailand has a, you know, a very vibrant civil society there. Um, those, those are the criticisms, uh, they, they are coming from there, not the national governments. So um, whether that, the dam actually affects the national responses to the various high-speed rail, I don't really think so, because both projects, the dam building, the high-speed rail projects are actually widely supported by governments. So if we, if we, mean, uh, if we mean national responses to mean government responses, then I say no. And the other thing is that, um, you know, under Belt and Road, these dams and the high-speed rail projects are all coming together under Belt and Road. They've been placed on the Belt and Road Initiative as Belt and Road projects. So they are linked in that way. Um, I think that's, that's all I have to say. I don't know where the mic and change is. Can I, before we move to some, Selena, I just want to follow up. Do, do you, um, are you saying that there's some kind of coordination that's going, I mean, because I, I, I would be surprised if there was the kind of coordination, at least on, on, on the part of the various Chinese um, actors involved on those two sets of infrastructure projects, but. Uh, I, I, no, so I don't think that the, um, there is actually coordination among the ministries or perhaps even the companies, um, but because you have the hydropower, so it's Sino Hydro building all these dams and then the, the uh, infrastructure project, CRC doing all the, um, the high-speed railway stuff, I'm not suggesting that, but as in being designated as a BRI project, they're all being lumped together under right. BRI. Um, and, you know, it's, it's about developing the Mekong region. So basically, the, in the Mekong region, the pro infrastructure projects, whether they are dams, whether they are high-speed rail, have been lumped together under uh, the theme of development under BRI. Thanks, Selena. Uh, Mike, did I you might just to... inject a, a thought here. Uh, I believe the uh, question was asked about the upper Mekong. And I think we have to disaggregate between the upper Mekong and then let us say once it gets into Laos. Uh, there's a lot of worry and at least uh, I've been up in the uh, area of Yunnan and uh, the headwaters of the Mekong. Uh, China has an inner a water law and it's basically, uh, Selena will correct me if I'm wrong, but basically, China within water that flows within China's borders is China's to do what it wants. That's the basic principle here. And so there's been a lot of criticism of China's building of a huge cascade of dams within its own boundaries. 
Uh, and that has a lot of negative effects. Well, it puts a lot of power for regulation of water flow in China, which you could understand lower riparian states wouldn't appreciate. But there isn't on the other hand, and that is that most of the flow of the Mekong is generated once it's out of China. So all of the water problems on the Mekong are not because of China, although a lot are. So it, the, the hydrology gets a little relevant here. The other thing I would say is that the Laos have a, they're, they're asking where's our revenue gonna come from in the future? And simplistically put, they want to charge a tax on all the railroad activity going through. They want to be a toll booth, so to speak. And then on electricity, they want to use their great hydro potential to become the battery of Asia. And they're already exporting power to Vietnam and, and back to China, actually. So, uh, you know, it's a complicated, uh, the calculus, is, and China is meeting some goals of the players and at the same time it does its own thing in China is offending the interests of Southeast Asian countries. So I think it's a complicated picture. Right. Maybe I just, uh, because Mike reminded me of something. Um, the, the water law that you're referring to, it takes what is known as the absolute sovereignty view of um, the resources that travel through, uh, river resources that travel through China. So. Um, it's an absolute sovereignty view, meaning I can do whatever I want with the resources that go through my territory. Um, so this, this is obviously at odds with lower riparian. I mean, um, and most critically, actually, Vietnam, uh, who is suffering from the drought that's in the Mekong. So a lot of the countries actually from, from uh, the drought, Stimson Center is very much involved in this, Brian Allen and, and all that. Um, the, the drought, so Vietnam has actually been suffering from that and uh, it has been uh, quite unhappy with it, but I just want to point out one thing here and very quickly I will end, is that Vietnamese companies are actually involved in dam buildings as well. Uh, you know, um, the Long Prabang Dam, uh, Professor Lampton, we were, we were there, right? Yeah. Uh, in Prabang, but the Long Prabang Dam is actually built in partnership with the, with the Lao government. Uh, Thai companies are, are involved and so are Vietnamese companies. So, you know, there is all this, um, uh, what I'm trying to say is that while countries may be unhappy with what China is doing up, up there, there's very little they, they can do uh, downstream or even voice strong criticisms because they have very little mor moral authority. Uh, they are in different degrees involved in this dam building projects on their own parts of their, the, uh, they, uh, they all take this view that they have a right to develop their uh, resources. Even it's Vietnam, Chinese companies are involved in the upstream activities. It's really interesting that you say that. It reminds me of work that I was doing on hydropower way back in the day, that some of the biggest opponents to these large uh, centrally mandated projects were from the local governments that wanted to build their own smaller dams. So, uh, you know, it's... Uh, we seem to just see the internationalization of uh, kind of some uh, lo local domestic politics, which is fascinating and leads me to the last question. We don't, we're running out of time, but maybe we can do a lightning round. Um, really, the basis of the question is, um, and this comes from Hoska Coleman, a PhD student. Um, the, uh, uh, and the question is, what happens when China is the cause of conflict between governments and citizens? Um, and she cites Myanmar as an example, and the uh, uh, Mietsone Dam. And uh, it's a complex question, but maybe one of the ways to, to, to get at it is by doing it in a lightning round like this. So um, uh, I don't know who would like to go first. Um, Chung Chui, you want to go first? Um, I actually, uh, I think that question perhaps is for Selena and Mike, but I did notice the other two questions, uh, uh, they were before that. If perhaps uh, that's uh, mainly for me, maybe I address the other two questions. The question from Mario um, is about the, uh, uh, her observation that the performance-based legitimation and identity-based don't seem to be the same and uh, why they are on the vertical uh, axis of uh, the, the metrics. So the answer is, uh, yeah, they are different. There are two different, uh, two of the three are different pathways of legitimation that I talk about. And uh, the reason why they were there on the metrics, it's uh, mainly because of I, I was emphasizing about the relative degree 
of development versus the other pathway. And hence, uh, they were on top of the metric, metrics. And then for Chu Ping, who's the question about whether or not the smaller countries, to what extent uh, smaller countries in Southeast Asia embrace the idea of connectivity? Uh, the answer is uh, clearly that uh, from, and I learned from uh, various uh, scholars, uh, Southeast Asia based scholars like uh, the late Eileen Bavira, Chiang Wan Ariswa, well, and so forth. All ASEAN countries, big and small, developed or less developed, all are committed and uh, take connectivity uh, very seriously. In fact, uh, early on, uh, we know that uh, we, ASEAN uh, do, does have the master plan for connectivity. So that itself uh, already shows that uh, all 10 ASEAN countries take connectivity development very seriously, but they do face financial constraint and other technical constraint and hence the need and also the demand for external partnership. Belt and Road come into picture, but there are also uh, uh, other external players that are coming into play. And uh, I would think that uh, over the long run, we are going to see uh, more broader and also uh, uh, more competitive, competitive uh, processes that would be uh, come under what Mike has uh, described in the book as the balanced uh, connectivity. John, um, thank you very, very much. I uh, thought I might lightning round, just uh, you, you in effect ask what are, uh, to the degree that civil society and uh, let's say domestic societal interests come to bear on this, how do they generate conflict and what can be the result? And it seems to me the ultimate result is that projects can be scrubbed. <laughs> you can invest as they did in the Mitsun Dam in Myanmar, you know, millions and millions of dollars in feasibility studies, preliminary foundation work, and then the regime uh, comes under sufficient societal pressure, even a military regime like in Myanmar, uh, that they in fact back out of the project. And Myanmar uh, is now trying to find other projects to uh, satisfy the Chinese as replacements, so to speak. Um, but I think you, you can see societal groups get upset for a number of reasons. Vietnamese got upset when there were offshore disputes with China nationalism kicked in and any talk of selling or leasing land to China became a non-starter uh, topic. You can see it when the Chinese bring in workers and uh, I, I, I won't mention the countries, but you know, sometimes it, 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 it has a waft of uh, colonialism. I remember one person uh, described, well, one Chinese worker is worth five other countries workers which is worth 10 other countries' workers. That is to say, we have a preference for Chinese workers. Well, you bring them in and they are in enclaves and uh, you, know, you get lots of young males in a society. You see this with our own military outposts in the Pacific. Uh, so you've got lots of societal uh, friction that way. And then corruption. I mean, the Malaysians, you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Chung Chui, but Essentially, Najib was too corrupt for the society to tolerate. Is that a fair characterization? And you see the results in uh, the 2018 election. Yeah. One of the main reasons. Right. So I guess this gets to our overall point is China's powerful. China's imp uh, got lots of resources, but there are lots of points of pushback. And China, if it's going to be you know, influential, sustained, and bring a lot of its projects to successful completion is going to have to learn. Selena, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, just just very quickly to add on to Mike's point, which is that um, at the end of the day, I think we have to remember something, right? There is such a thing as great power restraint, and sometimes when uh, China becomes the issue between governments and society, China can be the solution. Uh, what China will do, because uh, recently in Cambodia, we all know about the casinos, right? Chinese run casinos. And it has been going on for years where civil society and you know, people on the ground have been complaining about the criminal, criminal activities in Sihanoukville and in other places as well in Cambodia. And the Cambodian government is on the Chinese side, right? So, what, uh, so one of the criticisms is that you know, um, the Chinese embassy in Cambodia is not doing anything about these kind of negative pub, uh, public perception. But recently, what Cambodia did was to, uh, sorry, what China did was to close down some of these casinos. I mean, so what I'm just saying is that, uh, what I want to highlight at, at uh, you know, my, my last sentence, which is that 
Small states have agency and great powers need to exercise restraint uh, when it comes to certain things like even public opinion, they have to react. Uh, you can't be a leader without followers, uh, in the words of some other academic friends that we have, we say the same thing, right? I mean, you can't be a leader without followers. So great power is trained, smaller states can bind their hands. Thanks, Selena. So Mike, uh, do you have uh, any penultimate words of wisdom to uh, close us out? Well, uh, no other than to thank you and just say that um, I think this book probably points in two directions. As, as China becomes a little more, let's say, closed relative to the last, in terms of interviews and so on, we're going to uh, be pulled towards more comparative studies and looking at China's impact on surrounding or other countries. In other words, we're going to have to do more comparative research from a variety of perches. And uh, so I think in terms of just the methodology of the book, this may in indicate at least one direction for future uh, uh, research. The other thing is that I think infrastructure is messy everywhere. Mm. And we can spend our time looking at all the problems China generates with its activity, to put that way. Uh, but on the other hand, infrastructure has problems everywhere. And so I think it's an argument to, when you look at these kinds of areas, whether it's dam building, infrastructure of other sorts, uh, in many respects, China's got the same problems that everybody else has. Thanks, Mike. Um, let me just, I, I want to thank all of you as well, but let me just say just a few more words in closing. Um, that, you know, Mike, Selena, Chung Tui, you've broadened the parameter, you've done a number of things with this book. You've broadened the parameters of the study of China. You've made a compelling case for the importance of in-depth field work and multiple countries, in multiple country studies. And you've set the bar very, very high for scholarly collaboration. Um, and you've also put flesh on the pared down analyses of BRI, making the actors, the stakes, and the strategies almost tangible by comparison. And so what I would tell the people who are, who are still with us, if you want to see what the future is, this is it. So I want to thank the three of you for sharing with us this wonderful study and uh, and your time and i want to thank all of the people in the audience for attending